Thank you for joining us today. If you are looking for a way to strengthen your own open education community of practice, we hope our experiences in hosting the Open Education Cross Canada Coffee Chats will be useful to you. This session is an overview of our experience over the past 10 months or so, organizing a monthly series of Zoom calls intended to strengthen the open education community of practice in Canada. My name is Anne Ludbrook, and my colleagues Olga, Paula, Kate, and I are all academic librarians working within post-secondary educational institutions in Canada. Lisa is a librarian who works with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, CARL. We are all members of the CARL Open Education Working Group, and the five of us make up the task group on community of practice. In 2019, CARL formed the Open Education Working Group, a group of Canadian librarians working in and committed to open education. Its activities and programs are designed to bolster open education as an emerging area of practice for research libraries and support the development of national leadership in this area, including supporting open education, community of practice development in Canada where possible. The early development of Carl's Open Education Working Group was inspired by the wonderful work that Spark had undertaken in open education in the US. We were in part inspired by Spark's open education activities, but we felt that we needed a Canadian community. Nicole Allen was involved with some early community building and strategy meetings, and we had Spark membership on our open education working group. We also ended up reusing some features of the Spark Lib OER monthly community call in our community of practice calls. One of the first working groups created by the first 2019 to 2020 Open Education Working Group was the community of practice group that consisted of Ali Versluis, Hope Power, Michelle Braley, Olga Perkovic, Rosari Coughlin, and Stephanie Quayle. They did a scan of already existing Open Education Community of Practice groups in Canada. They also came up with several recommendations on best practices for the Community of Practice work going forward. Some of their Community of Practice recommendations were using existing Community of Practice networks in Canada. The Community of Practice group did an environmental scan of already existing Community of Practice groups in open education. They felt that existing provincial and national-based communities of practice could be used as a starting point for further community of practice development, include all open educational professionals. Although CARL is an association of research libraries and almost all the members of the open education working group are librarians, due to the collaborative nature of open education production, the membership was adamant from the get-go that our community of practice efforts should be inclusive of everyone working in open education. We also wanted to ensure that there were bilingual or francophone opportunities. In order for a Canadian community of practice to be truly inclusive, it needs to be a space where participation can happen in both official languages. And we also wanted to make room for Indigenous perspectives. Crucial to this exercise of the community of practice was to make sure that there was participation and input of Canadian Indigenous scholars and those already working on open education Indigenous projects. In an upcoming session to be held in the new year, we plan to have a session focused on Indigenous recommendations and experiences with OE creations. These recommendations underpinned how we approached the development of the Carl Community of Practice in the 2020 to 2022 team. When our Community of Practice task group was formed, we discussed what we wanted to offer in terms of activities and supports to help those working in open education in Canada. We certainly didn't want to duplicate supports that already existed internationally or regionally, and we wanted to make sure we focused on national projects and challenges. We talked about whether we wanted to create a listserv, host regular webinars, or maybe something more informal. The provincial organization, BC Campus, though its mandate is to support OER adoption and production in its home province of British Columbia, had already been facilitating, facilitating some exchange at the national level. It had created a Canada OER listserv and had held cross-Canada calls about twice a year where people involved in OER gave updates on their work. However, not long before our task group started our work, BC Campus had asked if others would be willing to organize these in the future, so we knew they'd probably be open to us filling this gap. Although the Canada OER list was not terribly active, we opted not to create a new list, but rather communicate with the community via this existing one. And on every call, we encourage those who aren't on the list to join it and we hope to see increased use of it as our community of practice strengthens. The Portage Network, 
which at the time was a sister organization of CARL and which focuses on research data management, had been hosting something called water cooler chats. These were informal drop-in calls that were very successful. We thought this might be a good way to provide a stable, consistent support for our community. So this is one of the inspirations behind the coffee chats. We use Zoom as our platform, as most people in academia in Canada are very familiar with it. Our calls are one hour long and they take place once a month. Even though we sometimes have over 50 attendees, we use the Zoom meeting functionality rather than webinar, which allows everyone who wants to do so to turn on their camera and speak freely. And this helps create a community spirit. We've opted not to record these calls so that they can stay informal and low stress. The structure of the calls has evolved over time. On our first call, the members of our task group were introducing the series and we'd created a few icebreaker polls in Zoom. We still do these things, but for the rest of the call, we posed open-ended questions that we hoped people might answer live. After the call, we debriefed and found that few people were really comfortable speaking up, at least at this first session. Many prefer to contribute in the chat box in writing, and we felt that it might be useful for a while anyway to bring in speakers similarly to Sparks community calls. And that way we'd have at least part of the call being programmed in advance. As it turns out, having speakers has worked very well, not just because it cuts down on the awkward silences, but because it creates a great opportunity to reach out to those outside of libraries to grow our community of practice. We've done this by asking people we already know for recommendations for new speakers, depending on the topic. More recently, we've really been making a concerted effort to ensure diversity in our speaker panels. Kate will speak to this in a moment. We haven't had any difficulty finding topics for our coffee chats, but we certainly appreciate receiving feedback and suggestions from attendees, which helps us reflect the community's needs and prioritize topics. You can see on screen the topics we've included up to now. We've taken advantage of new projects. For example, inviting the team behind the code of best practices and fair use for OER in order to engage the Canadian community in a similar conversation about fair dealing. Following on the work done by BC Campus and eCampus Ontario, we held in May an OE Cross Canada check-in, which was intended to be similar to the Canada OER calls they used to, uh, to create. Since Canada is a bilingual country with English and French as official languages, we've been working to be inclusive of both languages. Bonjour à tous les participants francophones. I'll admit that this can be difficult as many Canadians only speak one of the two languages. And it seems most often the English speakers don't necessarily understand French, some of them anyway. We have not entirely solved this problem, but we're working on it. The OEWG, Open Education Working Group, has a separate task group devoted to the Francophone OE community. So that group collaborates with us and organized a coffee chat in February that was entirely held in French. And this focused on initiatives that are producing or adapting OER in French or in both languages. One challenge to note that the Francophone community has that is different from the rest of the country is that there are far fewer existing OER in French, <clears throat> so there aren't that many opportunities to adapt content. This means more focus on creation or translation of OER. That task group is currently preparing another Francophone coffee chat that will take place next month in October. For the coffee chats that are not held in French, we invite attendees to contribute in the language of their choice, and we offer to provide a written English summary of any comments made in French in the chat, or in the notes, or both. I don't think we've had anyone take us up on this offer, but we'll continue to offer it in case anyone wishes to use it. We do also enable the automatic transcription in Zoom, which we know can be helpful to people whose English comprehension is better in written form than spoken. In keeping with the casual and informal tone that we wanted to set for the coffee chats, we decided early on that the coffee chats would not be recorded and PowerPoint slides were not required. We also recognized that some valuable information would be exchanged during the coffee chats, and we wanted some way to record the discussions, presentations, and questions and answers. Some members of our subgroup subscribe to the Spark Libraries and OER Forum listserv and attend the monthly Lib OER community calls. These calls use running notes for their meetings. Participants can contribute to the notes during or after the meetings, and anyone can read the notes from their previous calls. 
Using this as our model, we decided to create a running notes document for our coffee chats. A bit.ly link for the notes is provided on the slide. You may view the content of the previous coffee chats, starting with the first one, which took place in January. At the start of each call, we ask participants to add their names, titles, and institutions or organizations to the notes so that we may see who's on the call. Participants could also indicate why they were interested in attending. Some participants prefer this way of communicating and sharing than speaking to the larger group or writing in the chat. Here you will see a sample page of the running notes document. You will see the theme of the call and our assigned roles for that call. And you will see the start of the document where the participants added their names, institutions, and interests. There are some benefits to using a running notes document for the coffee chats. One is that the notes are useful for those who cannot attend the call. They serve as a record of what transpired on the call so that anyone can check back and read about the content of the speaker presentations. Follow up on links included in the document and read the questions asked and answers provided. The running notes are also useful as a networking tool since names and contact information are included in the document. Participants who wish to engage further with the speakers or others on the call may do so by reading the notes. There are some challenges to using a running notes document for the coffee chats. One is that the note taker may not capture all of the content taking place during the call. If multiple speakers are involved, and if the participants are engaging in an active discussion, it may be difficult to capture all of the information being exchanged. Sometimes speakers fill in the gaps in the notes, but this is not often, unless we specifically ask them to add information to the document after the call. Another challenge is that the note taker has to incorporate the information from the chat to the document. Depending on the topic, this may take a significant amount of time to do. On one call, the chat was not captured and we missed some activity from the chat in our notes. One way to define a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. To help foster a community of practice, it's important for us as the chat organizers to create a space that is welcoming for everyone. This means a community of people from diverse backgrounds and people with different roles in relation to open education. We want to draw from and reflect the community's wide ranging interests and we want to make participants feel safe and comfortable. We use Carl's code of conduct as a guide to create a harassment and discrimination free space. We state at the beginning of each chat that all participants must adhere to the code and we link to it in the running notes. We recognize that we are five white women who organize the coffee chat and as such our own backgrounds don't represent the diversity of our community. Furthermore, we are all librarians, but the audience we've aimed to reach includes faculty, students, instructional designers, and OER practitioners of all kinds. We've made an explicit effort to have diverse speakers. Racial diversity and representation of equity deserving groups is of great importance to us. In addition to this, Lise mentioned our work to include Francophone speakers. We also seek regional representation across the provinces and territories and representation from different types of post-secondary institutions, university, college, and CEGEP. So how do we work to achieve this diversity among speakers? One of our strategies has been to reach beyond our own professional networks to other practitioners, asking them to suggest potential speakers. This greatly expands our knowledge of the OER community across Canada. We also work to stay up to date on Canadian OER projects by paying attention to listservs, conferences, social media, and announcements from different sources. The chats are meant to be a place for informal discussion. Discussion doesn't always flow freely in large groups, so we have different ways for people to communicate with and contribute to the larger group. Participants can share ideas, experiences, resources, and questions with the group through Zoom's chat tool. We have one to two organizers monitor the chat. Audio, often with Zoom's raised hand tool. Participants can comment by turning on their microphones and typing in the running notes. Participants can respond to questions in the running notes or add to what the note takers have included, for example, by adding resource links. We've experimented with different ways to jumpstart discussion. We include a fun multiple choice poll question at the beginning of the chat to break the ice. For example, what beverage are you drinking? We also include a topic oriented poll. If we ask for questions or comments and there are none right away, we go to prepared discussion questions. For example, how have your collaborations changed since the pandemic started? 
Since establishing the Open Education Cross Canada Coffee Chat in January 2001, we have experienced a lot of trial and error. And as a result, our events have evolved along the way. When planning our first event, we wanted to create a welcoming and informal environment. So we strayed away from the more structured format of guest speakers. With little scheduled content to fill the hour, we relied on discussion questions and participant contributions to keep the conversation going. Naturally, there were some lulls in the discussion and much of the input from attendees was limited to the Zoom chat. While this was a great start, we recognized that there was room for improvement. So as a group, we brainstormed ways to keep the conversation going, which led us to incorporate more polls, prompt questions, and guest speakers. While it contradicted our initial plans, the addition of guest speakers in particular was a great way to emphasize the coffee chats topic and include expert insight that encouraged group discussion. However, the inclusion of guest speakers was not without its challenges. Inviting guest speakers now meant that we had to carefully plan out how each session would be broken down, including how many speakers should present, how much time each speaker should be allotted, and how much time should be reserved for discussion afterwards. We also had to be considerate of each speaker's time as they are managing busy schedules. Therefore, it was important that we select a topic, deliberate on who, would like, who we would like to invite as guest speakers, and then reach out to those people in advance. By confirming these details prior to the event, we have been able to provide our speakers with enough notice to reserve the date and plan what they would like to discuss. For larger topics, such as the Cross Canada Country Check-In, where we accommodated 24 speakers across Canada, we encountered new obstacles. For this event, we asked the speakers to prepare a very quick update on topics such as new initiatives, policies, or funding. Although we had set a strict two minute time limit for each speaker, the coffee chat still ran about 10 minutes long, which left no room for discussion afterward. However, even with this minor setback, the cross country check-in event was one of our most successful coffee chats to date. This was a great opportunity to hear what was going on coast to coast, and we plan to continue hosting these sessions more regularly, perhaps even twice a year. Since our cross-country check-in, we have worked hard to find a balance between the time devoted to speakers and the time devoted to discussion. Depending on the topic, this sometimes means limiting the number of speakers present or encouraging attendees to ask their questions in the chat. This, of course, is a work in progress, so we are always looking for new strategies to encourage discussion and keep the content engaging. Since January, we have worked to build a diverse open education cross Canada coffee chat community. When first establishing our coffee chats, we determined that developing a community that included all open education professionals and not just those working in libraries was an important goal. To achieve this, we invited common open education collaborators, such as instructional designers, faculty, and students, to both attend and speak at our events. Building a community that includes a variety of open education professionals and different perspectives has added a lot of value to our coffee chats and has been a great selling point. In order to make these inclusive events successful, we recognized that we have to create content that is engaging to everyone and caters to the interests of all open education professionals, not just those working in libraries. Asking attendees for input on topics of interest and monitoring the discussion for common questions was a great way to get insight into what people found appealing. When initiating the coffee chats, we also quickly understood the importance of including diverse voices, especially as speakers, and ensuring that everyone felt represented. To achieve this, we reached out to professionals who could speak to diversity, equity, and inclusion within the field of open education. We have also collaborated with other open education groups to highlight diverse voices 
and reinforce the sense of community gained from our coffee chats. One example of collaboration includes our February coffee chat, which was hosted by the Francophone OER group. We hope to continue partnerships like this and participate in more collaborations moving forward. At our first coffee chat, we had a total of 52 attendees. While this was certainly a success, we are always working toward increasing participation. When first discussing how to promote our event, we decided it was best to use established avenues and not reinvent the wheel. As a result, we focused on using pre-existing listservs to promote our events. Initially, this was a great way to spread the word. However, as our events have progressed, we have begun to brainstorm other promotional methods that we could apply to grow our attendance. We began personally inviting people within our own networks and encouraging speakers to bring along their colleagues, such as faculty or students who are also working with open education. When it comes to growing an audience though, one of the biggest lessons we have learned so far is that it is important to be patient. It takes time to build your attendance and grow momentum. Attendance can depend on a number of factors, such as how frequently you hold events, what other events are being scheduled during a similar time, and the time of year. For example, we decided to take a short hiatus from hosting coffee chats in July and August, as we realized that many of those in our target audience would be taking time off for the summer. We've also discussed different ways to strengthen the community of practice going forward. One approach is to increase the activity and the, on the Canada OER listserv. We can use the list to start sharing information about completed OE projects, and we can use it to seek collaborators for new or ongoing projects. We would also like to use other communication channels available to, to us, such as Slack and social media. There is an existing open education subcategory on the librarian scholarly communication Slack channel. And we can make a greater effort to promote the coffee chats using the hashtag OECCCC. We can also identify and make connections with provincial community of practice networks and seek cross promotion opportunities. In our September call, we promoted the open pedagogy group, which originated at the University of Alberta. Finally, we would like to plan for Indigenous-led and focused coffee chats. This may involve more planning and outreach activities on our part. However, we consider this to be a priority for our group. In closing, we would like to provide you with some tips for starting a community of practice of your own. Use the communication channels that already exist and reach out to the network of people that are working in the same field. In our case, we use the Canada OER listserv as one of our promotion tools. Depending on the topic, we often reach out to known colleagues to ask, act as speakers. Let participants give feedback on topics. There's a place in our running notes for participants to add their topics of interest. We refer to this feedback when we choose our monthly topics. Make room for regional and diverse voices that reflect your communities. The community of practice was formed with a recommendation to engage the Francophone open education community. Coffee chats for the Francophone participants are scheduled twice a year to provide opportunities for that group to meet. Consider having expert speakers to jumpstart conversations. Experts can provide insight into a topic that you as the organizer may not. Take advantage of the experts who are often more than happy to participate and share their knowledge and expertise. Try to meet consistently. The coffee chats are scheduled on the third week of every month and take place at the same time. This familiarity can help build a foundation of regular participants who may then invite others to join. Try to make it fun and casual. We run seasonal polls about drinks or food at the start of every meeting to keep things light. Our calls are not recorded and we do not ask our speakers to prepare formal presentations such as slide decks. Again, this keeps the meetings light in tone and helps them to run efficiently. On behalf of Anne, Lise, Paula, Kate, and myself, thank you for attending the presentation and for your engagement in the chat. If you would like further information about the Open Education Cross Canada Coffee Chat, 
please reach out to any one of us during or after the conference.